The Kutta Sikha is Chelech of Aleph, Volume 21, the Sikha of Abayakal Pikudei. This Sikha will have an amazing insight into the concept of Klal versus Prat, or Klal and Prat, collective and individual detail. Uh, just to familiarize ourselves, in the early MEMS, that's the 1980s, that ever came out with the campaign to unite all Jews from all over the world by means of writing Sifre Torah Klolim, to write Sifre Torahs, which will include all Jews by everyone signing up for a letter in the Sefer Torah. Another concept which is worthwhile to familiarize ourselves with, the halacha is that when a letter is written in a Torah, and the truth is that the same is for Tefillin and Mezuzas and Megillah, in order for the letter to be kosher, it has to be an individual letter. Meaning, it has to be what's called mukov gvil. It has to be surrounded by parchment. Meaning, it has to be self-standing. It has to have at least microscopically some space around it in order for it to be an individual letter. Let's get into the sikha. So as discussed many times, the content, the theme, or you can say the motif of every parsha is expressed in its name, in the name of the parsha. So in our parshas, which actually we have two, we have Vayakel and Pikude. It's understood that they, they too represent the theme of the entire parsha, each one respectively. However, when you take a closer look, it almost seems as if the names don't actually match up to the theme, to the content of the, 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 the individual parshas. Let's take Vayakel. What does the word Vayakel mean? Vayako means to congregate, to gather together, that you take many individuals or many details and you make of them one unit, one congregation. And that is reflected in the word Vayakel, which comes from the word Kohol, which means you make one new entity, a Kohol, a congregation. It becomes like a new Metzias, a new entity. You see, in the other expressions of gathering, you don't have this unique ex, uh, expression, this unique quality of bringing things together that they become one. Rather, sometimes you gather things together, they become united. There's an isuf, there's a gathering, but not necessarily that they become, so to speak, one new entity, one new unit. So that is vayakil. Now let's take a bikude. What is bikude? Bikude means counting. Eile bikude hamishkan. These are the countings, the various countings taking tally of all the various things, whether it is the gold, the silver, and so on, as described in the parsha. So this actually indicates a separation, a division of each individual thing. Each one amounts to a number. Each one accounts for being an entity that it is. So according to this, having explained what Vayakil and Pikude mean, now if we take a look at the parshas, it seems that they don't match up to the content of the parshas. You see, because Vayakal and Pekudi in general speak about the implementation of the commandment of building the Mishkan. Moshe Rabbeinu commit, uh, shares with the people, he describes to them the commandment that he received from Hashem, what to do, how to do it, and then how they went about implementing it, and then he gives them a tally, he gives them a sum total of everything that came in, all the contributions, what it was used for, the amounts that it was used for, and you know how everything was allocated. But if you look at Vayakil, Vayakil seems to be talking about a lot of details. It describes all the various components of the Mishkan, all the various vessels in the Mishkan, each one individually. It says he made this, he made that, and it describes what he made, how he made it, how it was done. On the other hand, Pikude actually has some totals. In other words, Pikude, which the word, as we said, means in the counting individual things, but in Pikude you have the exact opposite, where everything comes together. Moshe Rabbeinu summarizes, Moshe Rabbeinu tallies up and basically puts into units everything that was used. So, you know, all the gold, all the silver, and so on. So it would seem that the names don't match up in actuality. Vayakil, again, Vayakil ends up speaking about details. 
And Pikude ends up speaking about collectives. So it doesn't seem to make sense. Now, perhaps we could have tried to answer it as follows. You see, Vayakel was, is not talking about the whole Parsha. It's rather describing that important prerequisite in order to be able to build a Mishkan, in order to be able to have a proper valid Mishkan, which is a communal edifice. So they had to gather together, become, so to speak, one entity, become a congregation. And through becoming a congregation, now their individual contributions no longer were individual property, and they became the property of a collective, of a whole. That perhaps can be some explanation why the parsha is called Vayakil. But that's not enough. It's not sufficient. Why? Because this doesn't answer. It doesn't, it doesn't um, take care of the question that we asked regarding Pikude. And moreover, it still would not do justice enough to the idea that we said in the beginning of the Sikha, which is that the name of the Parsha brings out the entirety of the Parsha, the whole toichen, the whole content, the whole theme of the entire Parsha. This would seem to only be addressing the very beginning of the Parsha, the prerequisite to the building of the Mishka. So the Rebbe says in order to understand this better, we'll take a look, we'll examine a halacha in the Rambam, in the Sefer HaMitzvah, in which he describes the mitzvah of building the Mishkan. I'm going to quote, this is what he says, that Hashem commanded us to build the Beis HaPchidah, the house of choice, meaning the holy Beis HaMikdash, for service, for his service, and in it will be all the offerings and the burning of the fires constantly and so on and so forth. And then he continues, and this is what he says in the Torah, meaning the, the source for it in the Torah is the Pasik, the Asu Li Mikdash, that they shall make for me a sanctuary. Then the Rambam continues after that, and he says, this klal, meaning this general thing, this collective thing, includes many different kinds, many different details, many different vessels, which are the Menorah, the Shulchan, the Mizbeach, and all the other parts, all the other components of the Mishkan. And then he says, quote, all of them, Kulam are all mechelke hamikdash. They're all parts. They're all um, components of the mikdash, and all together they are called mikdash. They're called a sanctuary. And then he concludes and he says, and Hashem spelled out individually the commandment for each and every part for each and every component. So we need to understand. After the Rambam already had said that all the kalim, all the vessels, all the components are all part of one thing, a part of the Mikdash, and that all together it's called a Mikdash, all together it's called a sanctuary, meaning it becomes a collective, why does he have to also later add, what does he mean by adding that, oh, the Torah already commanded us individually on each and every component. This seems, in fact, to, be, to contradict or to say the exact, to indicate the exact opposite of what he just said. He just said that they're all one collective that come together. They're all, in other words, individual parts of one whole. And now he says how, he now he's pointing out how really they're all individual commandments. They're all individual entities, all individual components. That's number one. Number two, what, what exactly is he telling us with this? In other words, besides the fact that it seems to contradict what he just said, but what is he really saying? What is the value in what he's saying? What is he trying, what message is he trying to convey to us? So the Rebbe says to understand this, we'll take a look and get a better appreciation of any time we have a klal and a prat. We have a klal, typically, what is a klal? It's a general uh, collective thing. It's one major unit that is comprised of many components. So it has many details. But there's three ways that one can approach it. There's three ways to look at it. In other words, there's three perspectives. You can look at it, number one, and say, each individual in itself, each individual component that is, each individual thing in itself, really doesn't have its own unique individual value. However, after you have the wholeness of the whole unit together, now they have somewhat of a value as part of the klal. In other words, the prat has the value not as a prat, but rather as now contributing to the wholesomeness, 
to the wholeness, to the unity of, the, the oneness of the cloud. That's one way of looking at it. Another way, that in that you can say number two, in essence, each individual component, each individual thing has its own value, has its own status. However, after they come together, they now make up, they now, so to speak, create and make up a new entity. They make up the cloud. But they have their own value, had, and perhaps still have, because they are who they are, so to speak. Now they come together to contribute to something more, to something greater. Example for this, if you think about it, in real life, is let's take a minion. In order to have a minion, in order to be able to say Kadesh or Kedusha, you need to have 10 individual Jews. Now, every single Jew on his own, on her own, every single Jew is a holy entity. It has a value, a great value. But now when they come together, they create a new entity, a new concept, a, 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 a entity of even greater Kedusha, of greater holiness, one that warrants and gives us the ability to say Kedusha, to say Kaddish, and so on and so forth. So that's a second way of looking at Klal and Prat, or Klal versus Prat. Now a third way, a third approach would be that indeed each individual thing on its own, in other words, prior to becoming part of the Klal, doesn't really have its own uniqueness. It doesn't really have its own individual value. However, after they come together and they, they create a, a, a cloud, an entity of a cloud, then each individual thing becomes important on its own. In other words, each individual thing becomes valuable in itself, not just as part of the cloud, but in, they, they assume an importance, they assume a value. A good example for this would be, if you look at the various um, compo- uh, sections of the Mishkan or the Beis HaMikdosh, so you have the various chambers, and each one has a different level of holiness. You have the Kodesh HaKadoshim, you have the Kodesh, then you have the courtyard, and so on. Now, if you don't have a collective unit of a Mishkan, then each individual space does not have its own Kedusha and its own. It doesn't have its own uh, holiness value, so to speak, uh, in, its, in its own right. However, once the Kalal was created, once this collective unit was created, established as a mishka, and now the whole entire entity is a holy entity, now each individual section, each individual component, each individual part has its unique holiness, one higher than the other. So they assume a uniqueness because they contributed to the cloud. Now these three ideas, um, meaning these three ways of looking at a klal and a prat, we can apply to the to this discussion of the klei hamikdash, the and, and the individual components, the individual vessels and components of the base hamikdash, the, the various objects that we use to fo- to come together to form the mishkan, versus the 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 general klal of the whole mishkan together. You can look at it like this: say number one. From one hand, meaning the, the, the first way of looking at things, that every single vessel, every single component of Islam Mikdash does not have a Kedusha and an importance on its own. However, once they came together to create the Mishkan, now they all become important as part of the collective, as part of the Klal of the whole Mishkan. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, number two, that each Kli each vessel, say the Menorah, the Shulchan, the Mizbeach, on its own had great importance and great holiness. But it's just that after bringing them all together and placing them for, in, in the formation and making up this whole unit of the Mishkan, now we have also, they come together to create a collective, a Mishkan, which now has and assumes a great holiness. That's the second way of looking at it. A third way of looking at it is that perhaps on their own, meaning while they're being manufactured, while they're being um, uh, constructed, the individual kalim, the individual components, they didn't have really a value. They didn't really have the kedusha in themselves. However, once they became, they come together and made up the cloud, they made up the mishkan, and now the mishkan is a holy place, and it has all the details in it, which allows it to be the holy place that it is, as the Ramam says, it has to have all these kalim, then now they are part of the cloud 
but also individually, each one has its own importance, its own uniqueness. This is the Menorah, the holiness of Menorah, this is the Shulchan, the holiness of the Shulchan, so on and so forth. Now, what is the difference really in practicality, in actuality? As we say, what is the Nafkemina Ledino? What difference does it make in Halacha, in, in actual implementation of Hashem's will, if you look at it this way, you look at it that way, you look at it the other way? The answer is, there's a rule, and the Rambam says it, that every single part of the Mishkan had to be done, had to be made, had to be manufactured, had to be done, Lishma, for the sake of the mitzvah. The mitzvah is the Asuli Miktosh, you should make it for me. For me, meaning you have to make it for my sake. Therefore, each part of the Mishkan required a kavana, an intention of lishma. Now the question is, what exactly did they have to be mechaven? What exactly did they have to have in mind? Did they have to intend while manufacturing that individual component? Say the boards or the, or the, or the menorah, so on and so forth. If you go according to the first way of looking at it, there had to be just a general kavana. In each in the, in individual component, each individual kli, not as the kli itself, but rather as this being part of the mishkan. So there's a general kavana that this is part of the mitzvah of asuli mikdash v'shachan But if you look at it from the second perspective, the way we looked at klal and prat, then you had to have a specific kavana while manufacturing it. While you manufacture, for example, the menoira, you had to think about the lishma of the menoira. While manufacturing the shulchan, it had to be lishma of the shulchan, and so on and so forth. But if you're looking at it from the third perspective, then there had to be a double lishma, a double intent. A, as a collective, as being part of a mishkan, and B, as in the, the individual kli, the individual component that was being manufactured at the time. Now we'll understand what the Rambam is saying. After the Rambam tells us that all the parts of the mishkan all together is, quote, called a mikdash, is called a sanctuary, meaning that it all together comes together and it's one klal, it's one general component. Then he adds and he says that already the Torah had specifically commanded each and every part, each and every component, telling us that the outcome is, the outcome, so to speak, the result, the, the bottom line of the analysis which we made La halacha, according to the Ramam, is that you have to have a dual kavana. You have to also remember on the one hand that these are all components, these are all parts of one major, one whole, one unified unit. And on the other hand, you have to have an individual kavana, of individual intent, lishma, for that specific item that's being manufactured. And this perhaps, says the Rebbe, is the remez, it's what's being hinted in the words Vayakal Bikudeh. In Vayakil, in Parshas Vayakil, although it continuously describes each and every kli, each and every component, as a separate entity, it says he made this, and then he says he made that, and he made that. In other words, each one is being described individually, yet on the other hand, it's Vayakil. They all come together, that they're all part of one collective. Because before they came together, before there was the Vayakel aspect of the building of the Mishkan, they really didn't have their own importance. They didn't have their own value. Now in Parshas Pekude, after it already tells us that, quote, all the Avoida, all the preparation of building the Mishkan was completed, that the whole collective is completed, now we have, we can appreciate better that each and every single Kli, each and every single um, component, each and every single vessel has also its importance, its value as an individual thing, thus pikude, separate counting. Says the Rebbe, everything in the Torah is nitzri, is everlasting, meaning it's not only something that happened back then, but this reoccurs all the time. How does this apply to us as Yidin? So the Rebbe says on the one hand, if you look at Am Yisrael, you look at the Bnei Yisrael, we really, we all make up one whole. We make up like one entire entity together. And in fact, that's why if one Yid is lacking something, the whole collective of Am Yisrael is hurting, is lacking, whether we feel it or not. But we're missing something because it's part of us that's missing. However, on the other hand, each and every single Jew is told that he is an Oilam Ali, he's an entire world. To the extent that every single Jew, 
not just the greatest Jews, not just the rabbis, not just the leaders, but even the simplest Jew could and therefore should, has to say, the entire world was created for me, meaning I am an individual, I am an important uh, unit as myself, as an individual. In other words, I have that importance. So by Yaakov Pekude teaches us that number one, a person, no person is an individual. No yid is an individual. You have to have both. There's Vayakal and this Pikude. You have to be Vayakal. You're part of a klal. You're part of a big unit, one whole unit. That is the unit of Am Yisrael. And that's what makes your importance. That's what makes gives you the value as a yid of who you are. And therefore, where do we see an expression of this? Before a yid is about to set out to serve Hashem, which the service of Hashem each and every day is in davening, in, in our prayer. What do we do first? As an approach, as a prerequisite, we accept upon ourselves, the, the mitzvah of loving our fellow Jew, meaning the unity of bringing all Jews together. I realize that I am not just an individual. It's not just me. It's not just about me. It's about us. It's about all of us together. And furthermore, when we pray, we always pray, including everyone, even if you're davening without a minion. You don't say, Please bless me. You say bless us. You don't say please bestow your kindness upon me. You say bestow your kindness upon us. It's always about the Jew being part of the collective. On the other hand, however, when a person does, when a person contributes to the cloud, when a person takes from their own time, from their own energy, from their own, their own life, and gives for the collective, contributes time or, or, or energy or money, whatever it may be, it may seem sometimes that I am taking away from myself. I'm losing. I'm going to be less than. The me, the I, the individual is losing out because I'm contributing and I'm giving it away to, all, to the others. The answer is no. Vayakil Pikudi tells us that when you have a contrib- when you give, the individual gives a contribution to the cloud, not only does the cloud benefit, not only does the whole unit benefit, but you individually now gain in importance. You individually gain from this spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, whatever it is, you gain from it, you become Pikude, you become that individual count as a result, not in spite, but because of your contribution to the cloud. And says the Rebbe, this idea, this concept also applies to a Sefer Torah. When you look at a Sefer Torah on the one hand, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of letters. Each letter individually is nothing. But when they come together, they now make up a Sefer Torah. Now it has a ho- the holiness of an entity of a Sefer Torah, the holiest objects that we ha- the object that we have in Yiddishkeit. So it, they all become part of that collective, and they're all one whole unit together. But on the other hand, each letter is an individual letter. As we said in the introduction, each letter, in order for it to be kosher, has to be mukav gvil. It has to have its own individuality. It has to have its own entity established on itself, on its own. It is a separate entity. It's an important entity. It has its own space, so to speak. And this idea really comes about is because the Zohar says, Yisrael uraisa v'kutshavrichu kulachat, that the, Jew, the Jewish people the Torah and HaKadosh Baruch Hu are all one thing. And therefore we find this idea both in Am Yisrael and in the Sefer Torah. That just like a, a Yid is part of a Klal, and that's what makes up his individuality, and because of that he is an important individual, so too the letters in the Sefer Torah, together they make up a Sefer Torah, but each letter remains and is supposed to be its own individual thing. And the Rebbe says that the Hira, the lesson from this is, to add every effort and to try and 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 um, accomplish this idea of uniting all Jews, Yisrael, Uraisa, Kuchibrichel, uniting all Jews together through the Torah to come closer and one with Hashem is by uh, recruiting as many Jews as possible and try, uh, trying actually to get every single Yid to be part of the Sifrei Torah HaKlolim to have their own letter in the Sefer Torah.